Greetings. Welcome back to um, your drawing class. And obviously for the first part of our experience together, you learned about the proportions of the figure, did plenty of figure drawing for the whole body. And a lot of times it's easy to sort of avoid doing the head or indicating where the facial features are. So uh, now we're going to focus in on that and talk about the proportions of the head and some of the common um, mistakes people make when they go to draw the human head. So um, the skull is very much an important part of that. And here we have a side view of the skull. And um, as you'll see with some of the images you'll see later on, this is the underlying thing. Now the flesh is on top of this obviously and it adds bulk in different directions. But underneath are these forms and support structures. I borrowed a lot of these images from a book that I own, uh, this particular book, Complete Drawing Course by the Diagram Book. So if you want to check this book out from the library or order it on Amazon, this is your source for that. It does have a whole lot of helpful activities. Um, I just really liked their uh, diagrams on how to approach drawing the head since I can't be there in person with you. So back to the skull, as you see there on the right, these are fairly universal from individual to individual. And on the left is a somewhat rudimentary sort of interpretation of the basic map of the facial features. Number one being that if you have an oval, the eyes are in the middle of the head, like vertically in the middle of the head. So often people tend to put them up to about here somewhere in the middle of the forehead. And oftentimes if you're doing a drawing of a face and you're like, what is wrong with it? I just don't know, I can't, why does it look so funny? And a lot of times it'll be that the eyes are too high. They're almost never too low. I don't know why that is. I think it's because in our perception of faces, the hairline comes down so far and then the eyes are close to the hairline. So they must be close to the top of the head. But in fact, they are not because we see up to the, midpoint of the head where the head rounds back. And then below that, you'll see that about halfway between, about the lower quarter, is between your nose and your mouth, or anyone's nose and mouth, roughly speaking. So this is a gross interpretation of where the forms are. It's a good place to start. This looks like an egg head. So it's not exactly um, realistic yet, but it's a good, it's a good starting point. This image just uh, cleans up the skull a little bit better so that you can see where those um, changes are, the features. So um, eye socket to eye socket. Again, the chin on the egghead drawing is a little bit short, but there's a good start. This image describes well how the flesh bulks out on top of the support of the skull. Notice that you have the hollow of the eyes and the hollow of the nose and the nose is on the front of where that nasal cavity is. Also notice that the mouth, and this is not something we think about very much, at least in this photo, the mouth is sort of toward the bottom of where the teeth are. And as I sit here and try to think about it, I don't know if that's the case for everybody. But at any rate, you have that skull and then there's quite a bit of flesh and volume that comes on top of that. And of course, uh, a fluff of hair would add uh, more volume on top. This is a really handy diagram. It shows you that essentially, from a side view, if you're looking at the face, the edge of the, cor at the corner of the eye, straight down, um, forms a line that when you draw back to the ear, you have this nice right triangle that goes from the eye to the ear and down to the chin. If you find yourself drawing from the side and something looks wonky, do this little test and see if your locations are correct. And that can be very helpful to you. And this illustration shows how the egghead image was, was devised. Uh, you start with the basic oval and then the eyes there are cross-haired right in the middle of that oval. Um, and then you start breaking down the proportions of the, sp the face beyond that point. But of course, the head isn't a flat, straight-on object. More likely than not, you will be drawing 
heads and faces that are turned hither and yon. And so then you have to depict the volume of the head as it moves through space, looking up, looking down, um, even just kind of leaning over, twisting. If you've ever seen uh, a wig dummy, a wig support, whatever they're called, I don't know. They look a lot like that shape that you see on the top row, that kind of um, crash head, crash, crash test dummy. Yeah, crash test dummy head looks a little bit like that. But then in the lower right image, you see how the lines are where the eyes are. And then the line that comes down the center of the forehead down the nose and it actually angles behind the nose to the base of the chin. Those lines are important to locate, just like when you're drawing the figure, and I would say, find the center of the back, find the center of the front, and what is it doing? Is it twisting away from you? Same thing with the head. If the head is moving this way or that, then those are good indicators of what you should be paying attention to in your drawing. Heck, go ahead and put tape on your face. I mean, you're your own model at this point. So experiment and put tape on your face and look around and see what the tape does. And this is yet another illustration showing the depth and volume of the head on the neck, which would be resting between the shoulders. Also notice that the back of the neck curves up and then there's the back of the skull there. You've got a lovely little S curve happening. The neck is not sitting on a stump. Uh, unless someone is purposely in that position. Naturally, the neck, there's a hollow here at the back of the neck. So pay attention to those little things. Also notice that the face is on, it dwells on the front of the head. So both these crosshatch drawings of this will help you hopefully visualize in space. That the head, the ears are on the side of the head. You turn around to get to the face. And then if you could, if this were a transparent object, you would see the ear on the other side of the head at the same uh, latitude. As soon as you get your approximation of where your eyes are going to be, it's a good idea to go ahead, mark where the centers of your eyes are, the pupils if, if the, the subject is looking straight on, and draw those circles so that you start thinking about them as orbs and not as little slit shapes. So that when you go to model the area around the eye, it will start to be form and not just lines to you. So a couple good views here. Side view, notice that the face slants down from the nose backward a little bit toward the chin. And the truth is, this stuff just doesn't come in handy for observational drawing. I couldn't resist throwing in um, my sadly appropriate Bitmoji, which pretty much encapsulates the whole thing there. But you could analyze this face and say, oh, mm, the eyes are halfway above in the head. And then the mouth is about mm, just halfway below the nose. So even if your end goal is to go into illustration and animation, these will still help you. Even if it's because you want to not do those things, if you want to make sure something doesn't look too much like a human, then change these aspects. Or if you want something to really look like a human, say, if it's not then uh, do pay attention to these observations and rules. Now, observation in action. This is a, a beautifully made portrait of this woman. And what I really want you to take note of is that her head is just slowly, is slightly downward tilted. And so this angle, the plane of the cheek kind of rises up, so to speak, and the, the eyes drop ever so slightly as the face drops. So when you're studying your subject, whether it's you or somebody else, think about what the lines are doing. If you imagine a line across her eyes, if she were looking up, it would be up here. If she, she, it's dropped a little, so it is dropped. Therefore, we see more of the top of the head also. That's something to keep in mind. And notice the center. The shadow well focuses what the center of her face is doing. Um, the forehead is still in shadow, but then the bridge of the nose comes down and then between the lips um, there and on down the chin. At the Metropolitan Museum of Art, they have um, a nice collection of what are known as the Fayum portraits. 
And these are very beautifully made portraits that, despite how young and lively these people look, they went on their mummies. Uh, we don't think about people this age being those who would be um, put to rest, but in fact, these were burial portraits. But this is another great example of uh, depictions of the face. The eyes may be a little over, over exaggerated in their size, but that can also be um, sort of a psychological effect of somebody who perhaps was a great seer. This is totally my interpretation of that. Um, but they are quite beautiful and I encourage you to take a look and we'll have a couple of those to look at. This man's portrait is a little more realistic in the proportions of all the facial features, including the eyes. It's quite naturalistic and he has a great head of hair. Something to keep in mind is that children's facial and head proportions are different from humans. This is one of my own sketches from a number of years ago. And when I look at it today, I'm like, the head, the skull looks a little too long, and it might be. But the reason that it is maybe too long is because there, wa there is, was a slight exaggeration of the head compared to uh, a grown human. So I'm throwing myself here uh, under the bus to show you some of my okay, but not quite perfect drawings. And here's another one uh, from the same time. Notice how small the face is on the overall head. A child's face is, occupies much less proportion of the overall head. And here's another one of mine from many, many years ago. Again, the, vol the volumes, the shape of an infant's face are different even from a toddler and a boy. These things just change, you know, obviously as we grow up, so think about puppies. Puppies are very warm. <laughs> puppies are very round. Sometimes I guess they're warm too. Uh, but it's not too different for humans too. We start as round forms. Sometimes we stay round forms. That's okay. Uh, but as we grow, things move and sh change and become a little less round in general. It's a good idea to look again at this image, which you have seen before in a previous presentation. The glasses are a very clear indication of where the eyes are. And if you would take your measuring device and measure where they are in the head from the chin to the top of the head, I bet you they'd be smack dab in the center. It's not a bad idea to take photographs, take a two dimensional image and just do a little measuring um, in order to improve your skills in on the spot, observationally making um, measurements for what you're trying to draw. It's not a bad idea at all. So even if your method of representation is not straight blended shadows and everything exactly as it appears, because the proportions are the same, it's still a convincing image of uh, a face. So I included these slides, this one and a close-up of it, to point out the fact that these are tools that contemporary artists use. This is not just about practicing for yourself. It's not just about being in a class. Hopefully you will take these things and you will apply them to the things you really want to do. I realize with assignments, they may not be the thing that you want to do, but they hopefully are a means to an end. And this is one end you might pursue. And I wanted to include a couple images as the first uh, drawing you saw where the head is tilted into a not straight ahead angle. This one's a little bit more so than what you've seen so far. So a couple changes are you see a whole lot more of the top of the head than before. So if you think about drawing your oval and then measuring down, you're going to have to add volume to what would be the back of the head going back. Because really, as I look at this face, the hairline is almost, it's just above the midway, midway point of the shape of the face and head. And the eyes are about one third of the way toward the chin of the whole overhead shape of chin, face, and then head. So you have to watch those things. As the head turns, those proportions will start to turn also. They'll start to shift. 
And remember to note the center lines. What are the center lines doing? When you have a symmetrical subject matter, like generally faces are, that's really helpful because you can start to make essentially uh, a grid where you have center line, eyes, bottom of the nose, mouth, chin, and even then start to cut in where the cheekbones come down into the face. Like you start to build the architecture just by creating lines. And as long as your proportions are right, that's a really good start. So speaking of lines, here we have another face. It's turned away from us. Notice that the whole face, if you look at the shape of the head as one shape, the face is about one third of that overall shape and then two thirds of it are the back of her head as she's turned away from us. In the next slide, I've put some basic lines of where the center line is and where the eyes and the bottom of the nose are and some of the angles of the cheeks to illustrate what I was just talking about. And the face happens to come from this lovely Vermeer painting. This is another thing that wouldn't be a bad idea to take a two dimensional image of a face. It doesn't even have to be the subject you're going to do and try do this little analysis on it. Find where the center line is, the center of the forehead down to the bridge of the nose and from the nose to the chin. And what are the angle of the eyes? Actually, when I did this, the angle of the eyes was the first thing that I did. It's kind of the most obvious thing that you can do is to locate the angle of the eyes. And then, because this is a digital thing, I copied that line at the same angle and moved it down to where the mouth was because the mouth, unless it's in a twisted position, is going to be at the same angle as the eyes and so is the chin. So I copied those lines. I then made a line from the eye to the back of the head. I copied that line and I moved it down to the bottom of the chin and the top to indicate what the volume of that face would be. Now, of course, the jawline doesn't go straight back. It's sort of it's carved up and in a little bit, but this gives you a block to start with, to start carving your form out of for the head. And what fun is it if you can't break the rules? I couldn't resist putting this in. Um, this is from Saul Steinberg. I saw an excellent exhibition of his at the Art Institute of Chicago a few years ago. Um, so that's the thing. It's great to know how to do it, and I hope that you learn how to do it. I hope you develop that ability. But it is sort of also about controlling, having control, essentially, because if you can have control over it, then you can artfully break the rules. So work hard and then you can start to have some fun.